First of all, I'd like to make a clarification from last week's sermon. Uh, I use a bad choice of words with the word snobbishly when we're talking about meekness. I uh, didn't want to use that word. Uh, probably meant to say steadfast, so uh, sorry if I've caused any anguish with anyone. Seeing the city, he wept over it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We can ask ourselves this question. Why did Jesus call certain individuals to follow him closely? For example, in the priesthood or in religious life, whether it be a monk or a nun. Why do we have consecrated souls in the church? And the reason for this, the primary reason for this, is to follow him closely to be close to Christ, a spouse, a friend, intimate, associate, and to cause Him great honor and pleasure through this. Now, as a consequence of this primary reason, it is to help Jesus to save souls. That's why He gives us this task. If it was just the primary reason, He will just blow the whistle and pull us all up into heaven. But we have to stay here, and this is a a life of fight. And so therefore, we're helping Christ to save souls. So everything we do, whether it's brushing our teeth or chanting the, the, the divine office, as consecrated souls, we are advancing the cause of Christ. We are pumping, if we use that expression, pumping in blood into that mystical body of Christ so that souls everywhere that Christ has his, his gaze fixed upon may receive eternal redemption, may receive those graces of salvation. And so this explains the vocation that we have as consecrated souls. And so the fact that Jesus today weeps in the Holy Gospel, he weeps over the city of man Jerusalem, a consecrated soul, a follower of Christ, cannot remain indifferent to this reality. Perhaps in some occasion, biological tears will also flow from the consecrated soul's eyes. But above all, up and beyond that, there must be a special call to fidelity in our own personal duty and living out our own personal rule and constitutions of our order. So therefore, I would like to exhort us to truly collaborate with Christ in order to save souls. Today's focus is on the fall of Jerusalem which is a very graphic, historic example of when there are souls who reject graces and who do not receive these graces or receiving them, having them all turn to void. So therefore, let us go through the steps of this fall of Jerusalem so that we and our prayer can understand the reality and the gravity of our mission and the gravity of the fact that so many souls are rejecting graces out there. So Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, and the consecrated soul here in the United States weeps over the United States of America. As we see all this anarchy raging throughout the entire country, we see so many souls uh, being lost. And therefore, we need to see this of Jerusalem in order to understand the gravity of of our own fidelity to Christ. Dom Prosper Guaranger has a great description of this plight of Jerusalem as he takes everything from Josephus, which was a historian, a Jewish historian during the times of Christ and the apostolic times. 
Well, first, in the year 6066 AD, Cessius Gallus, with a Syrian army, for, so therefore representing the Romans, campaigned against Jerusalem, but all of this came to no avail. Even the inner circles of Cessius Gallus said that the man was nuts because he couldn't even overtake an easy target. And so therefore he was making a fool of himself just sitting there and not being able to advance to conquer Jerusalem. Why did he not conquer it? Was it just foolishness or was he actually gone batty? What was the reason for it? And it was, as Don Guaranger says, that it was because divine providence, providence did not allow it. There was just warnings to get the Christians out of there as quick as possible. And so, Celestius Gallus sheepishly retreated. And then the next year, in the year 67 AD, Vespasian also attempted, and he was unable to attack. But he was in the northern parts of Israel this time, up there in Galilee. And he too was not able to attack. But what happened, what changed everything... On June 29th, the year 67 AD, the great two apostles, Peter and Paul, are martyred in Rome. And as soon as Peter closes those eyes, upside down crucifixion, and St. Paul's head bounces three times upon that Roman soil, at that very second, Vespasian invaded Galilee and left it in ruins. That was the whistleblow to start the divine wrath upon Israel, upon the holy city to come. And so right there, right when St. Paul's head bounced three times on the ground, Vespasian, on the same day, uh, ripped right through the fortress of Jodapara, and 40,000 Jews were slaughtered on that same day. And there were only two men who survived, one of them being Josephus, the historian by which we know all of these chronicles of everything that took place in those years leading up to the fall of Jerusalem. And then came the Gamala Fortress in Galilee. It was also attacked. It was a, for a huge fort hugged a cliff. So therefore, right off the cliff, right off the fort was a cliff that had a huge fall. And when all inside the fort was being killed as the, as the Romans were pouring in into the fort, the remaining men assembled all the women and children and hurled them off the cliff so as to save them from enemies' hands. And then after they hurled the women and children off the, off the fortress into the cliff, off the cliff, they themselves threw themselves down to their doom. And not one survived the attack. And then came the Sea of Tiberias, that Sea of Tiberias that Jesus our Lord in times past calmed the troubled storm waters of Tiberias, now uh, was filled with caucuses and the flowing of Jewish blood. The whole lake seemed to be filled with blood. And then in the spring of 68 AD, Vespasian then drove the Jews from the banks of the Jordan, and they were running toward Jericho in retreat as the Romans were chasing them from the, from the, the river. But at that time, the river was uh, overflowing. It was springtime floods. And right at the gate of Jericho, there was a big flood, so the people could not go into the gates, and they were all slaughtered at the entrance of Jericho by the Romans. And then the Romans looked forward to taking over Jericho, and then something happened, and Nero died, and Rome was in great chaos for one whole year, trying to reestablish their power among themselves. So therefore, there was a whole delay in 
this attack and campaign against the Jews. So therefore the Jews, after a whole year, thought that everything went back to normal, that God had intervened and spared them. So therefore they started having the Jews come back from all over the place. And there it was. In the year 70 A.D., in springtime, during the Pasch, the 10th Legion marched from Jericho and set up camp against the Jews, and the Jews became absolutely frightened what they were seeing. But something happened in the Jews. Uh, the Galileans that were coming in with th- two of the great leaders that w- they thought they started to think that be, they, he, they were the Messiahs to free all the Jews from the political uh, clampdown. They began to f- form factions, and within factions within the holy city of Jerusalem, there began to be these huge campaigns against each other. So the Romans just watched all of this as the tens of thousands were being butchered among themselves inside the holy city of Jerusalem. The Jewish zealots were then uh, divided among themselves and they were clamped into the temple and they were living a life of complete discouragement and complete uh, sinfulness. And they were, get this, the religious of the day. They were the ones that were culprit of this entire fall of the Jewish people. And so therefore, as all of this continued, uh, the Romans then decided to attack as they were camped right at the very spot where Jesus uh, wept over the city, right? By the Garden of Gethsemane on Mount of Olives. And they were there the whole time. The Jews came out twice to try to attack the Romans, but were pushed away like flies in a question of minutes. And then, therefore, war ensued. But before the war ensued, as the Romans pounced Jerusalem, uh, there was a great famine. And Josephus says that they, he didn't know which was the real cause of the fall of Jerusalem. Was the sword or the famine? And you had cannibalism going on. You had people going out to, at nighttime. 500 at night were being butchered by the Romans as they snuck out into the fields to try to grab some herbs and wheat for themselves to bring back into the into the city walls 500 were being killed each night for weeks and all of this was occurring and then throughout the attacks uh, from the start of this campaign among the civil war and then the Romans upon the, the Jews uh, 600,000 people were killed and the only ones left in the city at that time were old men and women in the, in the very inside of the city of Jerusalem. And then a very special event happened, and this is why we say, this is why we have this gospel today, uh, August 4th. So therefore they try to make it as close as possible to August 4th, and this ninth Sunday after Pentecost, the gospel, because it was when the temple burned down. So Titus, who's leading the campaign, told his, his soldiers, do not burn the temple down. I want the temple to stay intact. Uh, but at this point in the outer precincts, some Roman soldiers were putting out fires that were burning the outer precincts of the temple. And so these zealots who were extremely saddened and hungered and starving uh, didn't know what else to do. So they came running out and attacking those Roman soldiers who were putting out the fires. So then Roman soldiers pulled back and started attacking them and pushed them back into the temple. But as they pushed them back into the temple, in those fortresses of the temple, these Roman soldiers came in as well, (laughs) unexpectedly. And then through the struggles there within the temple, um, the one Roman soldier forgot the, the, the orders of Titus and set a fire to some of the inner precincts of the temple. And before you know it, the entire temple was up in flames. A glorious temple uh, was put into flames. And it was said that all the wounded, all the starving, 
And all the Jews who are still remaining saw these flames going up in temple. And they said that they let out cries of groanings and anguish that were able to be heard in the city of Jericho, which takes a whole 45 minutes drive with a car to get to. And that was the end. Everything was ruined in Jerusalem. All what? Because of what? Because the graces that were given were neglected and were treated with great indifference. And so therefore, as we continue this holy sacrifice of the Mass, my dear religious, my dear sisters, uh, religious nuns, May you also, as you receive communion, say to our Lord Jesus, O Lord, may the grace of God be not in vain in me, first of all, as St. Paul says. And then, ask our Lord Jesus to pump all these graces so that souls in the hospitals, those who are dying, those who have left the church, those who hate the church, those who are apostates, may receive that, that unwarranted grace of conversion before it becomes too late as a country and as a nation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.